Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to the Honest Youth Pastor YouTube channel, the channel that helps believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. Today, we're going to be doing that once again with a sermon review from someone that you sent in by the name of Leon Fontaine. Now, each time we look at the sermons, we look for three things specifically. First, we look for, do they read the scriptures? Pretty simple thing. Do they read the scriptures? Secondly, do they exegete the scriptures using context and culture to bring out application for the believer? And three, do they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? All three things are incredibly important. So let's go ahead and hop into it. Uh, going through uh, Leon Fontaine's message, How Are You Living?, I want to share something with you, but first I want to explain a problem that I see in so many people's lives. It's something that I had to deal with as a young pastor, and that's your focus as a Christian. You know, when Sal and I first came here to Springs 25 years ago, um, so much was happening and growing and going on, and, and the Christian faith we always talk about repenting of your sins. And so when you give your life to Jesus Christ, he forgives you of your sins. And then if you're not careful, you start always checking yourself out. Like it, back then it was, when I grew up, the, a lot of the pastors around would sing songs like, searching your heart, checking for sin. If there's any evil way in you, is there anything that's creeping into your life? They were so worried about sin that that's all we thought about. That's all we talked about. That's all. Am I getting proud? Have I, is my mind wandering? Am I doing what God wants me? Is my heart really loving God? And I would get so focused on that that I missed what salvation was all about. And I've noticed as I travel and train pastors and leaders in our church and other churches that when you give your life to Jesus Christ, something amazing happens. All of your sins are forgiven. And that's amazing! You get to go to heaven. It's incredible. But if that's as far as you understand salvation, your life on this planet doesn't change much. His intro is, hey, the problem is, you know, where's your focus at? If it's misplaced focus, it might hamper the rest of your relationship with Christ. So let's talk about what that looks like then in a way that's going to hopefully help you as a believer. That's sort of his premise as he starts off this sermon. And in fact, did you know that stats show us that for, for most part, the Christians have the same problems as the world, same percentage of divorces, same percentage of liars and cheats and, you know, and all the junk that goes on, same amount of depression and sickness. And, uh, and, you, and you kind of go, what's going on? Well, there's a way, there's something we have to understand about giving your life to Jesus. Not only is your sin forgiven, but this Jesus, he makes you alive. People are born. Every baby that's born on this planet is born into a culture, into with a nature of sin. What do I mean by that? It's a nature of fear. It's a nature where you'll have a hard time not being narcissistic, self-centered. Um, it's almost like, well, actually the Bible teaches us there's a mystery of iniquity and there's a mystery of godliness. Now, the mystery of iniquity is that each person is born onto this planet, and we're not born uh, where we are alive, where our spirit man is filled with the life of Jesus. Instead, people grow up, and they will struggle with their identity, with peace, with joy, with a sense of... Uh, it, it just. They just don't li really live the way God designed them in the garden. He defines sin as this... Um, incorrectness in one's life. So you're not living in the way as we were designed to live in the garden is how he says it. Like, so you're going to struggle with, um, uh, what did he say? Like narcissism. You're going to struggle with like, you're just not going to live a way that you're supposed to, which isn't entirely wrong, but it also downplays sin being, you know, missing the mark that God has placed. It's, it, it really downplays um, the, this rebellion toward who God is. So you are in, in our very nature outside of Christ, God has set a standard that Paul says in Romans is written on all of our hearts, but yet our sin nature, we rebel against it. We know what we're supposed to do, but we don't do it. And the way that Leon sort of lays it out here, again, I don't think that every sermon should have like fire and brimstone, like, um, you know, hard hitting, like, you know, make yourself feel terrible about yourself all the time sermon. But this is really sort of a, hey, you're just sort of off and Jesus saves you from your sin so you're not so off anymore. It's really how it comes, how, how it's sort of communicated here. 
sin isn't this enormous separation between you and and God. It's more of a hey, you're not living quite the way you're supposed to live. And when you accept Jesus, you're free. You know, you're you're saved from your sins, and you're enabled to live the way you're supposed to live, which is like a yes and no sort of, sort of thing. Yes, that does happen when when you believe and trust in Jesus by the gift of the Father to do so and are transformed by the Spirit to be and are continually sanctified to become more like Jesus. Like there's a lot going on there that does, you know, um, change the way you think and the way you live. But the way that sin is sort of outlined here is very much, I, in my opinion, very much downplayed in regards to um, this this separation between us and, and, and the Father and the severity of that separation. And not just like, the fact that we're a little off, but that we are like in full out rebellion. Like we know what God wants and we say, ha ha, we're not doing that. It's a little bit more than just being off. Now he does make the point that when we are saved from our sins, we are, we are given new life, which that, that point, I think he gets pretty well on, which is this idea, like we're transformed. There's this something that comes out of us as a result of this transformation. And then he's going to sort of unpack that a little bit more as we go. Chapter seven, that literally when a person knows who they are in Christ, out of their innermost being flows rivers of living water. This, a lot of Christians think that's just, you know, give your life to Jesus, get to go to heaven. I'm forgiven. And I got to work on being good. Work on it. Jesus himself lives within you. And this alive, this, you are alive with the life of God. And so as you look at this, this is where you need to stay focused. Then you, you find sin no problem. You're so excited and focused and Jesus is so alive in you that life just changes. There's a verse in John 5, verse 39. Okay, so anytime a pastor references a verse, you obviously want to go there. We're going to be going to John chapter 5, as he said, verse 39. Now, I would write that down because this is sort of a red flag. Not that a red flag like, oh, John, you know, Leon's a false teacher. That's not what I'm saying, okay? I'm just saying a red flag as in if all we use is one verse, we want to make sure that we do our due diligence and say, is this verse being used correctly within the context? The full context actually starts all the way back at verse 18. But if you want to look at the section in which this verse is con sort of context in, it's 30 through 47. Let's look at it. Now, to give you kind of a reference of this, Jesus is talking to the most learned people of the then known Bible in the world. These are Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. They know the Old Testament, which is always here then. So here's what he says. You guys carefully study. You examine, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. And it says they do, in fact, the scriptures do, in fact, tell, testify, and witness about me, Jesus says, about him, concerning me on my behalf. Everything in the scripture is moving towards Jesus. The entire Old Testament is all prophesying and getting ready for the Messiah who would remove sin from the human race and again make us able to fellowship with God and to be ignited with the very life of God. And the New Testament is Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John doing it. I mean, and then the epistles are explaining it. It's all about Jesus. And yet people will come to Christ become Christians, and all they do is they're happy their sins are forgiven and they're going to heaven. Now, that's awesome. But I want to show you how to get a life. I want you to realize that if you live your life that way, you're going to be discouraged. You're going to be disappointed. We must recognize that a relationship with Jesus is crucial. And if we don't recognize that, we are kind of going to become religious people. So he does sort of set up that if you don't understand that there is there is more past just being saved from your sins, you are going to be pretty, I forget the way he just said it. You're, you're, you're just not going to feel like you're getting anywhere. You're going to be frustrated because you're always focused on that one thing and not on the life that is actually provided to you in Christ. 
um, as a result of your salvation. And now he's going to use sort of the rest of um, the sermon unpacking it. He's about to say uh, about being religious, which I think is a good distinction that he makes. There is a difference between living in light of the fact that you've been saved, knowing that you're a child of the king, and, and living that life out with all of its stumbles and issues and learning uh, versus being religious, which is saying, here's a set of rules, I have to live up to these, and then I will get the gift of salvation, and which is juxtaposed, right? One is, if I do these things, I get this thing. The other is, I am adopted by God, and I'm a child of God, and I'm trying to figure that out, and I'm, I'm living that out, which are two different things. Um, one of them is you obtaining it. One of, the, one of the other one is that you've been gifted it, and you don't have to obtain it. You just live in it. And that is what he's saying here in this regard is true because one of them, you will constantly feel like you're falling short because you just can't live up to that standard. And the other one is, you know, that you're loved and that love um, drives you to uh, pursue Jesus more uh, because, you know, it's a gift um, that you've been given, not something you can earn. So um, that's that's a good kind of call out that he's doing right now. Um, so he's presented it. Hey, if your focus is totally on sin all the time, you miss out on the life. And if that's, if, if that's all you're focused on, you're going to be miserable because there's more to it than just you being saved from your sins. Um, so let's see sort of how he unpacks this the rest of the sermon. And religious people are hard to handle because it's just a whole bunch of rules and regulations and trying to live up to it. Now, in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Let's go there. John chapter 1, 1 through 4. It says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, Jesus. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. When Jesus comes within you, He ignites your darkness. Wherever you don't know, whatever you don't know to do, and any need, where there's fear, where there where, where discouragement, sickness, this presence of God just flows out of you and meets needs. So I just want to make a point. Like up to this point, I was basically with him in regards to sort of how he was unpacking this in the focus. I'm not totally not with him now, but I just think that we need to look at First John one through. I'm sorry, John one one through four in context of what's happening here, the gospel of John is a megaphone saying that Jesus is the Messiah, that he, that he is God, that he has always been God, that he's not a created being. Like John is very adamant about this all through the gospel of John. So Leon here is though, he's using this verse uh, of light, right? So verse four in him was the life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. And using that light of men as sort of this, when Jesus, uh, when you realize who Jesus is, he comes inside you and he's the light of your life. He's going to be unpacking this uh, as we sort of walk through this. You know, 25 years ago when I first came to Springs and the church was, was just growing, it was just the amount of leadership that was needed was beyond me. And I remember with five kids and, and Sally, my wife, having to come to church and, and struggling to fit them in and park their cars and how many services could we fit and where are we going. And, and it was just like systems and structures and business and finance. And I was just, go, man, go. And at one point I forgot that Jesus was my helper and that he was with me. See, just really quick, and I don't mean to pick this apart, but it's interesting that he uses the term Jesus is my helper and he's with me. When Jesus said that he was actually, Jesus said, I ha he tells the disciples, I have to leave so I can send the helper. I can send the comforter. Um, and this is how we see the Holy Spirit acting in the believer's lives throughout the New Testament as, um, as the sanctifier, as the helper, as the comforter, as the convictor in one's life. This is the Holy Spirit's job to do that, to point back to Jesus. It happens to you the pressure and the stress begins to grow. Because if there's something that's not working, you think there's something you don't know, and you're looking for hidden wisdom. You begin to look for knowledge you don't yet know. If you can't get results, you begin to focus on finding answers, and 
The word I just used seven times was, I had to find it, me. Go find it, go get it, accumulate it, figure it out. And these keys, while it is important to grow and learn in wisdom, et cetera, et cetera, you can't ever lose the relationship with Jesus. I found that all that I learned could be applied. And I love, I love studying. I love learning. I love growing. I, I love taking on new projects. I love teaching business people and, and business owners. I love counseling with families and homes and teaching on marriage and raising kids and, and all the plethora of stuff that goes with raising up a, a great church. But I found out nothing can take the place of me having a relationship with Jesus. So this is where we start getting like, off of the text. So his two main texts, if we're going to say they were main texts, is going to be John chapter five and John chapter one. So it's just interesting um, how this is much more of sort of an advice time with Leon than it is teaching from the scriptures. We have used about five verses, uh, but we're not actually teaching from those five verses anymore. Um, we've referenced them. But now we're on, you know, when you're in a tough spot, realize that you can't do it on your own will and just ask Jesus to tell you which way to go. And then he'll tell you which way to go. Essentially is what John's saying. So don't focus so much on, you know, the sin uh, or being saved from your sin. Focus on as you live your life for Jesus, on which direction to go. And if you have a question on which way to go, ask Jesus and he'll tell you. It's essentially where we're at in the sermon right now. I would meet with people when I was counseling and of all that I had learned about God's word and, and in counseling with people and understanding, uh, you know, inner vows and, and strongholds and transference and everything from biblical counseling to all that the world thinks they know and, and get nowhere and just stop and realize I'm just not checking with Jesus. I say, Jesus, what's, what should I say here? And I would just sense coming up from within me, go in this direction. And I would go in that direction and watch this situation with two angry, bitter people just break and tears begin to flow as they would forgive. And we put our finger on the actual button. I have discovered that you will be very limited if you live your life simply with your giftedness, your strength, your ability to figure things out. And as you succeed, if you think it's because of your ability you are going to make major mistakes. But if so this is accurate. Like this isn't wrong in regards to if you're relying just on your power, you will fall short. Of, yeah, <laughs> that's absolutely true. As I've said in previous sermon reviews, right message, wrong text. Like what does this have anything to do with First John 1 through 4, uh, John 5 verse 39? Like it doesn't. Like we're not teaching from the text. We're, we're teaching a, 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 not even really a distinctive, uh, well, I guess it would be a distinctively Christian principle, which is that if you rely only on yourself, you are going to fail inevitably at some point. Um, and you need to rely on Jesus. So I guess it would be a distinctively Christian point, but it's not anything that we're seeing from the text that he's read through the, thus far. It's just him saying it. So where is this grounded in scripture then? Because if we're going to make distinctive statements of, as a believer, you need to not rely on just your, your knowledge, but you need to rely on Jesus, where do we see that in Scripture then? Like, what, where? Am I relying on Leon and him saying this, or am I relying on the Word of God? Because what you've shown me so far in Scripture doesn't say that. But if it does say that, where does it say that? I mean, I've said it a bazillion times. I feel like I just am on repeat. Just rewind, play again, rewind, play again. But when people leave the service, I do not care if they think that I was witty or wise or anything. I want them to be anchored in Scripture. So please give them the Scripture that it says and backs up the things that you're saying in your sermon. Because if not, even if you're just hinting at them, that's not incredibly helpful to them. Because they're going to come back to you over and over again. Like, oh, well, this was a really good sermon by what's his name right but they need to be grounded in scripture and know where this is in scripture and every one of us needs to be at a place where you have a relationship with jesus he speaks to you there's a sensing a knowing the church of jesus christ is so backwards on this 
that we have groups of people traveling the world just to get into a service where some prophet will give them a word. Some person will say, the Lord spoke to me. I've been at conferences where people are there, they want a word from somebody, and, and this guy will just say, you know, God's got a word for you, and he'll point at somebody, and the tears just start to flow, and, and they're sitting there crying, waiting for the word, and the word was a verse or something. <laughs> I thought, ooh. Why is the church of Jesus Christ so dependent on somebody giving me direction, somebody giving me a word, somebody had a dream, somebody had this for me? You know, I, I don't care anymore. I mean, there was, I've, had, I've gotten so many words from people that were so far off, but I'm glad that as I know his word and learn his word, as I get into situations, to just turn, just say, Jesus, what do I do here? So I do want to point out, I think that he's got a pretty good valid point here um, in regards to the fact that people are very reliant on um, pastors or well-known speakers or like influential people in their life to like, they will rely on them to be like their spiritual guide instead of the scripture. So they won't read the Bible, but they will ask you a thousand questions about what is sin and what direction they should go and how they should handle the situation and all of that, but they won't read the scriptures. His point here is, is good. Again, it doesn't have anything to do with the verses we read. We're not teaching through those, but um, the advice here is good. And so we must learn that you have a relationship with him. And when you do, when you do every area of your life, he will guide you through. And as you accumulate wisdom and read and go to school and learn and, and apply, it's amazing what God can do with you. But never allow what you've learned and who you are to rise up past God where, oh, I didn't have to talk to Jesus today. I got this. Big problem. Big problem. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall, which is why we must always see Jesus first. In John chapter 1, uh, and verses 1 to 4, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's saying here that Jesus, who always was, he's, that he's the Word. Now, this is a really crazy thing, and I can't explain it to people other than if you will develop a love for God's Word and read and, and get out to church and listen to messages and read great teaching books where you're just immersing yourself in the Word, that there comes a point if you'll pursue Jesus in the Word that it's amazing how all of a sudden you just sense Him and He speaks to you through His Word. And, and as you begin to deal with marriage and family and home and business and, and all that, that, there's no longer this, well, i got to fast for, you know, someone's i got to fast 40 days. I said, what for? Well, I'm just trying to make a decision on, on what to do and here. And I said, well, why do you got to fast 40 days? Well, I don't know, just get along with God. I said, God leads you moment by moment. People will ask me sometimes, you know, we'd like you to come preach for us over here at this date and this time. Could you just pray about it? I said, no, I, I'm, I'm not coming. Well, just pray about it. I don't need to pray about it. I know. Well, how do you know? I just know. I don't need to go find it and sit in a cabin for three days with no food and, and try to find God's will. I'm in the middle of God's will. I'm walking out God's will. And sometimes when I'm on, on point, things get rough and it's not going to make me get out of his will. And sometimes it's great. I, I'm on point. I'm, I'm the word. We so the one thing I would caution there is that really inadvertently sets up this sort of like spiritual hierarchy in the sense that if you're sitting in the congregation and you're like, wow, because I don't know which way to go. I've asked God and I don't have a clear direction. And I thought maybe I would, you know, go out and pray about it. But you're telling me now that I should be constantly walking in God's will. So I don't have to ask those questions. And I kind of just walk in his will. Um, I don't think that he's deliberately setting that sort of situation up because he's previously said that there's times that he realizes he gets off God's will and he's got to get back on it. And he's got to ask, you know, God, the, he keeps saying Jesus, ask Jesus the direction to go. Um, which again, I think is, he's conflating the Holy Spirit and Jesus and, you know, the roles of the Trinity here. But anyway, that aside, um, what he just said does sort of set up this spiritual hierarchy, which is where if I'm sitting in the congregation and I go, I don't know what to do in this situation. And you're telling me I should know what to do. Like if I'm in the word, if I'm walking with Jesus, I should know what to do. And I don't. And I've asked and I haven't got an answer and I don't know what to do. And you're telling me that if I was in his will, I would know. 
And it sort of sets up this whole, like, well, if I don't know, then I'm obviously not spiritual enough. But if I was spiritual enough, then I would know. So I need to sort of try to be more spiritual. I need to have that relationship with Jesus because I clearly don't. Because if I did have a relationship with Jesus, I would know what to do because I don't know what to do. I don't have a relationship with Jesus. And it, it sets up this confusion that's unnecessary. Like, there are times that you need to go and really meditate on a situation and pray about a situation and you still may not get a clear answer on what you're supposed to do. God taking you there, but you're with him. You're listening to him. If you're stuck somewhere in life, whatever that means to you, stuck relationally, stuck financially, stuck psychologically, stuck physically, maybe you need healing. I don't know what it is, but something stuck. Stop looking for the missing key. Stop missing, looking for the missing link. Stop looking for some new teaching. Stop looking for some new prophet somewhere to give you a word. Just Develop a relationship with Jesus. Get to know him for yourself. God never designed you to hear from him through only somebody else. Even as your pastor today, as I'm teaching you God's word, I'm not going to make decisions for you. you know, it was a wonderful day when I realized I don't have to answer people's questions. People often, and I don't mind this at all, they'll stop me in the hallway or they're going to say, Pastor, what do I do in this situation? And I'll listen to them, and I might prompt them in a direction. Well, God's Word says this. If it's obvious sin, I'll show them in the Bible. But a lot of times, it's choices between multiply good things. I never make that choice for them because I don't want them to be dependent on me. I'll say, I'll pray with you. See, and that's a good point, right? Making sure that people are reading the Scriptures, developing a relationship with God, and understanding them and not being reliant only on a pastor. Again, he does say, you know, making sure that you're not reliant on just, you know, getting information just from a person. God will uh, guide us and speaks to us through his word, through the shepherds he's put over us, through the friends in our lives. But the thing that he's pointing out here, like, I like what he just said. Like, it's not just, he is not the answer man for all your spiritual problems. And that's a good thing to state. Your pastor is not the one that you should go to for every spiritual answer in the world because God's giving you the scriptures. The shepherd is there to help guide, to help, um, you know, maybe clarify or walk with you through, you know, some difficult situations. But even in some of those instances, so are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so pushing and pointing people back to the word is the right thing to do here, which is where I'm so torn because there's parts of this sermon where I'm just like, ah, this is so problematic. And like, you're not spiritual enough. And if you were, you would know. And then there's other parts that I really like, which is like this advice here, which is like, I'm as a pastor, I'm not the answer man for everyone. Go to the scripture. What does the scripture say? And pointing them back to that. It's just like, I'm so back. I'm a ping pong on a table here on like my opinion on this. Where I'm starting to get stressed and more stressed and more as I'm trying to figure this out and figure this and fix this. And I'll just I'll go, I think I've been leaving God out of this one. And I just come back into things and say, Jesus, sorry. Whew, I'm so glad I realized it's going to be you anyway. So what do we do here? And, and how do we walk this thing out? And, huh, now that I'm back in a relationship with you, I'm feeling your peace already. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And boy, my body's healing up already because it's not designed to handle stress. And, and my relations are already getting better in two minutes because I'm finally back with Jesus. It's amazing what he'll do with you. Father, I pray for every person here that they would know how loved they are, that they would know that they're made in your likeness and image. They're all wonderful. They're blessed. They're intelligent. But Father, none of us are designed to do anything without you. And the future you have planned is so big we can't do it on our own. So help us to develop not another religion, but help us to quietly in our time with you Learn to sense your voice. Learn to sense your direction. Learn to feel your peace. Learn to walk in your joy. That, Father, our futures could be healthy as we advance your kingdom. I pray this. Every head bowed for just a moment. Okay, so he's going to go into like an altar call time, essentially. Uh, we're going to stop this sermon right now at, at, at the minute at 30 minutes, 53 second mark. If you want to watch, there's clearly there's seven more minutes left in here. Uh, a huge part of it is, you know, an altar car situation. A whole different thing could be said about that. I'm not 
I'm going to stop at just the sermon part because it's a sermon review. Um, so let's, let's get back to the main screen here. My overall take on this sermon is pretty much this. Like it's good pastoral grandpa-esque advice in the sense that it really comes off as like, if you're going to sit down with your pastor because you have a question, or if you're going to sit down with like, you know, your, your Christian dad or your Christian grandpa and you want advice, like this would be the sort of thing they tell you, right? Uh, you know, trust God, follow God, be in his word was essentially the whole thing. Like you're saved, but there's more to this Christian life than just being saved. And this is what it looks like. And that's sort of the tone and the tenor of the whole sermon. Um, we're not grounded in any text. There's no pointing back to the text. Uh, we sort of read the text almost as if just because we have to, <laughs> uh, so we don't make it all Ted talk, all like spiritual grandpa talk. Um, so it's not bad. Like the advice he gives, as I've already said, the advice he gave wasn't bad, but it wasn't grounded in scripture. He didn't teach us through scripture. He didn't you know, tell us, Hey, this is where it says it in scripture. He did direct us to do that on our own for sure, which is great advice, but we didn't get anything but good advice. And so when we're looking at sermons like this, we can walk away and be like, wow, that was really insightful. And technically, yes, it was insightful, but did it help us grow in the Lord? Are, 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 are we, are we built up? Are we edified because of what we just heard? And if we are edified, where did that come from, though? From Scripture or for Leon? Like, are we leaving going, wow, look at how God, how good God is? Or are we saying, man, Leon has some really good points. I'm going to have to think about what he said this week. Anyway, that's my two cents. What's your two cents? Leave it in the comment section below. And if you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. If you hate this video, I suppose you could leave a thumbs down. That is your prerogative. But if you think this might be helpful to somebody else, make sure you share it as well. That helps feed the algorithm, guys. And if you want to support us, links are in the description below. A lot of what we do on this channel is only possible because of our patrons and subscribers. And if you want to become one of those, you can do that on the links below as well. Guys, I'll see you later. Trust that this was helpful. Have a good day in the Lord.